Okay, we're going to continue antiderivatives and indefinite integrals today. And let's state as our goal to find some anti derivatives. Um, finding antiderivatives is harder in general than finding derivatives. And it's very easy to write down some very elementary functions where we just can't do it. I mean, the sine of x squared is obviously not a super complicated looking function, but in all of calculus one, calculus two, and calculus three, we'll never learn to find this thing, at least in a normal sense. So we have to be modest with our ambitions here. Hence the word sum. Let's start with power functions. Power functions were basically the first thing we learned to differentiate using the power rule. And they will be the first things we learn to anti differentiate. The integral, that is, the class of antiderivatives of x to the power of n, is one divided by n plus one times x to the power of n plus one. And then you have that constant of integration floating around. So this, this part of the form the should hopefully make sense if you think about it. Anti-differentiation undoes the derivative, right? So the derivative decreases the power by one. To undo that, we have to increase the power by one. <laughs> what about this one over n plus one term? Well, if we look at a concrete example, let's ignore that for the moment. And let's just say we increase the five by one to six, and that's all we do. If this is supposed to be the, and if this, is supposed to be the antiderivative of x to the fifth, then differentiating this should give us x to the fifth. Well, differentiating this doesn't give us x to the fifth. It gives us six x to the fifth. That six comes down. So the point of having a one over six there is that now when you differentiate that six and that one over six cancel and really do leave us with x to the fifth. At this point, examples we can do are going to be pretty plug and say. We've got this formula, let's mess around with it a little. Well, does anybody have any questions about this 
before we move to our new Friday. And let's do example two, the square root of x dx. This, just like when we were learning to differentiate our functions, we learned that, okay, um, to differentiate the square root of x, we just need to think of it as x to the one first, as x to the one half power. That same trick will allow us to integrate to this thing. Plugging and playing with our rule on this frame. So we should increase the power by one. One half increased by one is three halves. And then we're supposed to divide by this new power. You probably think, I certainly think, that one divided by three divided by two is some pretty ugly looking notation. Let's remind ourselves, we learn this as school children and then maybe forget it because we never use it again. But one divided by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal of that fraction. So one divided by the fraction, three over two, is the same as two over three. And there's our, our integral. I sometimes sort of step up and use integral and antiderivative um, just as literal synonyms. This is the indefinite integral. Every value of C gives us a different antiderivative. So two thirds x to the three halves plus one is an antiderivative. Two thirds x to the three halves minus seven fourths is an antiderivative. All of these antiderivatives together are the indefinite integral. Questions. At this point, we're quite limited in the examples we can do. We could build up something slightly more complicated. For example, we could ask ourselves about the indefinite integral of four times x to the eighth. And we talked about this yesterday. We said that if we have a constant in front of the integral sign, we can just move it out and not worry about it. That is to say, this is four, we pull that in, um, constant out, times the integral of x to the eighth dx. And then x to the eighth dx, One ninth x to the ninth. 
And I guess technically this constant of integration should go into the parentheses. So I'm just, I just is kind of a verbal tick of mine. This is the first time you've seen this. There's no just about it, but I'm increasing the power by one and then I'm dividing by this new power. So I increase eight to nine and then I divide by nine. And then there's, the, there's this sort of oddity maybe this is four ninths x to the ninth plus c and we talked about this a little yesterday the temptation is to think that i'm forgetting something but if c is an arbitrary real number, then four times c is also an arbitrary real number. I mean, what if we gave four times c a name? What if we called it d? Then this would just be four ninths x to the ninth plus d. So four ninths x to the ninth, plus a constant of integration. And we don't normally bother with this. We normally just say, well, four times a constant of integration is still a constant of integration. And we just write our answer like that. We'll do probably tomorrow, we'll do some application problems. I know maybe at the moment this is seeming kind of banal. But let's deal with this. The x to the fifth and the x first we'll deal with using the power rule. This negative one isn't really going to cause difficulty. We'll deal with this sort of as its own thing. And what we might remember, I mean, we talked about this yesterday, but until you started doing examples yourself, it can be hard to put all of this into your long-term memory. But what we said yesterday is that if we have a bunch of things added and subtracted together, we can just deal with each of them on their own. And what I also said yesterday is, if we're doing this, we're not going to bother having three different constants of integration. We'll just throw a constant of integration in at the end. So from x to the fifth, we get one sixth x to the sixth from x we didn't we didn't initially have any power written there but if you recognize that x is x to the first this does become a power rule problem one over two x squared. We're dealing with both of these the same way. We're bumping the power up by one, then we're dividing by the new power, minus the derivative of x is one. Therefore, the antiderivative of where n 
antiderivative of one is X. And then we have our constant of integration. And if that's not immediately obvious to you, you should probably probably erase, there you go, just commit it to memory. Yeah. Antiderivative of one is This same rule, by the way, lets us deal with any constant. The antiderivative of two, for example, is two times the antiderivative of one or the integral of one, I should really say, is 2x plus a constant of integration. There's one exception to this power rule. One power and exactly one power where this doesn't work. Let's look at that exception. The integral of X to the negative first. This power and only this power breaks the power. Let me put quotation marks around this. If we increase negative first by negative one by one, we get to zero. And we're then supposed to divide by that new power, but we can't because one divided by zero is not defined. The trick here, or maybe I should say the key, I don't know that it's a trick exactly, is that x to the negative first is one divided by x. And we've seen a function whose derivative is one divided by x, the logarithm. So let me keep the quotation marks because this is still a little wonky. The, the integral and the derivative undo each other, right? So if the derivative of the natural log of x is one over x, the antiderivative of one over x should be this. Or so it might appear. And this is almost right, but not quite. And the not quite comes from the fact that one over x, x can be positive or negative here, right? You can have one over five, you can have one over negative five, no problem with that. We go over here and suddenly X has to be positive. One over negative five is defined, but the natural log of negative five isn't. 
So something weird has happened here. And the answer to this weirdness is that that X needs absolute value signs around it. Now X can be positive or negative on the left. And X can be positive or negative on the right. And that bit of weirdness vanishes. Again, X to the negative first is the only power where logarithms come into play. Any other power, you just use the power rule. So, if instead of x to the negative first, we had x to the negative 0 0.999. Well, this is kind of close to the negative first, but it doesn't matter. This isn't a negative one. We're just going to use our power rule here. We should bump this power up by one. And we should divide by this power. And let me think, I've always, been bad at messing around with decimals in my head, but 0 0.001 ought to be one one thousandth, and you can therefore write one over one over one thousand as a thousand. Um, let's not get sloppy there, plus our constant of integration. So we can deal with any power. Let me sort of lay this warning down. I mean, this is just like when we were learning derivatives, but I want to be explicit that this rule only works when you have x raised to a power. If you try to use this rule for anything more complicated. Maybe you have instead of x to a power, you have the sign of x to a power. This rule does not work. We need some kind of some kind of anti-differentiation version of the chain rule to deal with this. So we're very limited. We can um, integrate x to powers. And at the moment, that's all we can really do. Well, we can also integrate things like polynomials where we have a bunch of x's to powers and we're adding them or subtracting them. <laughs> Having said that, we do sort of, if we think about all of the derivatives we've learned, every derivative we know gives us an antiderivative, gives us an indefinite integral. So we can also do some stuff with trig functions and some stuff with exponential functions because these are derivatives who we know. And I mean, what I mean by that is that, for example, the derivative of the sine is the cosine ergo an antiderivative of the cosine is 
the sun. This is what I mean when I say that every derivative we know gives us a corresponding antiderivative. And because we have the derivatives of, let's say four, let's not worry about the cosecant and the cotangent, because we have the derivatives of four trig functions, that gives us four corresponding antiderivatives. Not necessarily the most useful antiderivatives, it has to be admitted. The antiderivative or n antiderivative of the cosine is the sign. So that's good. And the sign gives us the negative cosine. What's up with that? Why that negative sign? Well, the derivative of the cosine is not the sine. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. So the antiderivative of the negative sine of x is the positive cosine of x. This negative sign I can pull out front. And then I have an equality, and if I multiply both sides of this equality by negative one, I get that the integral of the sine is the negative cosine. So next, I mean, in sort of an ideal world, we just keep going, right? Maybe, maybe we want to know the integral of the tangent next, but here we're kind of stuck because remember that the integral and the derivative undo each other, and we don't know any function whose derivative is the tangent. So we don't know the antiderivative of the tangent. What we actually get is the significantly less useful statement that the antiderivative of the secant squared is the tangent. So the tangent gives us this integral. It seems like a slightly disappointing integral because how often does the secant squared really show up in the daily applications? But it's what we get. And likewise, the derivative of the secant is the secant times the tangent. So we get an integral from this, but maybe not the most useful integral. And 
I mean, there's there's a very clear hierarchy here. Those top two integrals are going to get used a lot. Those bottom two integrals are going to be used much less frequently. Probably in calculus two, section eight point two. It might be the next time that these bottom two integrals appear, or we might use them a little towards the end of this class, but the top two integrals are really important. What else do we know? Well, I'm uh, racking my brains. The only other derivative I think we've learned in this class is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And that gives us that the integral of e to the x is e to the x plus a constant of integration. So we're going into this material with some background. But there are a bunch of sort of very standard day-to-day -day functions whose integrals we don't know and whose integrals we might never end up committing to memory. Like if you ask me what the integral of the natural logarithm was, I could probably figure this out, but it's not something I know off the top of my head. Integrals in that sense are much more limited than derivatives. There are just these very standard functions that are very difficult to work with, sort of in integral calculus. And the solution to this is going, I mean, looking way ahead, the solution to this is going to be to think of functions as being a bunch of simpler functions added together. You can approximate the natural log using a sum, and then you can integrate those terms. Um, that's for the second half of calculus two. That's a long way off. For now, that's, and I say us, what I really mean is let's have you take an integral for me. So let's make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, when we have addition and subtraction, we can think of it as a bunch of simpler problems sort of smushed together x squared is a power. We increase the power by one, and then we divide by it. The antiderivative of the sine is the negative cosine, or the integral of the sine is the negative cosine, whichever terminology you like. So plus the negative cosine, the integral or antiderivative of x is one, plus a constant 
of integration. And we can simplify this a little. Adding a negative term is the same as subtracting, giving us this as our answer. We have a little time remaining. Let's ask a question. What is the plus C term four? Is it just some technical mathematical thing that I'm doing because I'm a mathematician? Or does it serve some kind of concrete purpose? And it's the second one. The plus C is useful for something. And in particular, that plus C term gets used when you're taking antiderivatives as part of any kind of word problem. Let's say that an object is launched upwards with a starting velocity of 10 meters per second. Let's find the velocity function. V of T given that the acceleration due to Earth's gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Acceleration due to Earth's gravity is a constant. So we're casting our minds pretty far back now. This was way sort of at the start of chapter three that we talked about velocities and accelerations and positions. And we said, that the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. Ergo, the antiderivatives of the acceleration our potential velocity formed of us. And all of this sort of math notation is probably making this look more obscure than it is. Taking the derivative goes from velocity to acceleration. So taking the antiderivative goes the other way. It goes from acceleration to velocity. Well, given this and given our acceleration function, finding the velocity ought to be straightforward. Or, I mean, as straightforward as anything can be when it's a relatively new 
mathematical concept, but the velocity should be an antiderivative of negative 9.8. Acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. Velocity is the antiderivative of the acceleration. And the antiderivative of a constant is always just that constant times the variable. So now we've, we're not done, right? I mean, we're looking for a velocity function, but what we've actually found is an infinite class of velocity functions. If C were one, that would give us a velocity function. If C were negative three, that would give us a velocity function. So this isn't our answer, or at least it's not our final answer. And there's a piece of information here that we clearly haven't used. We haven't used our starting velocity. We haven't used the fact that the velocity at time zero equals 10. Going back here, we found that V of T equals negative 9.8 T plus C. If we now plug in the fact that N equals V of zero, well, V of zero is negative 9.8 times zero plus C. Negative 9.8 times zero is zero. And we get that N equals C. So these constants of integration are fitting terms, basically, to use a kind of convoluted phrase. They let us take a function and fit it to the data. So if we want an initial velocity to be something where we know what the velocity is when the object hits the ground, or we have some other piece of data that we want our antiderivative to satisfy, that piece of data is going to be used in this way by letting us find the constant of integration, C. And again, this is why it's so important. I mean, it's a very easy thing to do. You saw me almost do it early today, but it's very important not to forget that plus C term. Because if you had forgotten the plus C term at this stage in the process, you would then not have been able to continue. There would have been no way to use this initial condition that V of zero equals 10. All right, we'll keep going with this tomorrow. I don't know exactly, um, probably more word problems.
but I will see you. <laughs>